welcome to MSP lecture series on main group chemistry. Today, uh, let me draw your attention to the chemistry of group 14 elements. In my previous lecture, I had concluded the discussion on group 13 elements. So, let me begin today with uh, uh, discussion on group 14 elements. Uh, you all know that group 14 is in the center of the main group elements, okay, consisting of uh, 5 elements, carbon, silicon, germanium, tin and lead. And the electronic configuration in the valence shell of group 14 elements is ns2, np2 that is they have 4 electrons in their valence shell. And of course, carbon is the 17th most abundant element in the earth's crust. In nature, it is there in both free as well as in the combined state. And coal, diamond and graphites and metal carbonates, hydrocarbons and CO2 are essentially uh, the uh, carbon containing uh, okay, uh, entities, substances. Uh, and of course, carbon dioxide accounts for about 0.03 percent in air. Carbon is the most versatile among all elements in the periodic table. And uh, let us look into uh, the discoverers of group 14 elements. Although carbon is known, it was actually identified by A. Lavoisier in 1879. And of course, silicon was discovered in 1823 by Berzelius and germanium by Clemens Winkler in 1886 and tin and lead are known since 3000 BC. We do not have clear information about who were responsible for discovering uh, tin and lead because they are known since 3000 BC. Carbon occurs as diamond and graphite and in several forms of low crystallinity. In 1996, Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to three eminent scientists, Richard Smalley, Robert Curl and Harold Kuroto for their discovery of a new allotrope of carbon that is C60, uh, it is called fullerene named after Buckminster fullerene. Uh, carbon occurs as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, dissolved in natural waters and as and also as the insoluble carbonates of calcium and magnesium are also found in earth crust as well as in water. Uh, elemental silicon does not occur naturally, but it constitutes about 25.7 percent of earth's crust. And of course, uh, silicon is the second most abundant element of oxygen in the form of sand, quartz, rock, crystal, flint, agate and silicate and several silicate minerals. Okay. And uh, these are the three people who won Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1996 for discovering fullerene. This is Robert Curley and this is Sir Harold Croto and this is Richard E. Smiley. Okay. Uh, germanium makes up only about 1.8 ppm of the earth's crust. So, it is it is present in very trace amount in a range of minerals including zinc ores and also in coal. And tin is obtained from the mineral cassiterite. Uh, the composition of this one is SNO2, it is an oxide ore and besides that it has several other impurities. And lead is obtained from its sulphide ores such as galena is PBS or angelicite PBSO4 and cerusite PBCO3. Uh, and you can just uh, see the relative abundances of uh, the group 14 elements in the earth's crust. Uh, the most abundant one is silicon okay, uh, among all group 14 elements and uh, germanium and tin are in very small quantities. Sources of natural graphite are supplemented by manufactured material found by heating powdered coke. So, that means essentially one can think of making artificial diamonds by heating coke to very high temperature. Uh, for example, if the coke uh, with silica when it is heated to 2800 Kelvin, uh, one can get the artificial diamond. And approximately 30 percent of the diamond that is required for industrial use in US comes from the synthetic means. And silicon 
not of very high purity can be extracted from silica that is silicon dioxide by heating with carbon or calcium carb carbide in an electric furnace. Impure germanium can also be obtained from flue dust collected during extraction of zinc from its ores or by reducing germanium oxide with hydrogen or carbon. For use in the electronic and semiconductor in industries, we need ultra pure silicon and germanium so they can be purified further using zone melting technique. And tin is obtained from cassiterite, tin oxide by reduction with carbon in a furnace and of course, uh, uh, lead is refined from its uh, ores. And, and crude silicon is first converted to the volatile SiHCl3 trichlorosilane which is then converted back to ultra pure silicon by using chemical vapor deposition uh, called CVD and industrial CVD procedure involves uh, passing SiHCl3 that is trichlorosilane and hydrogen into the reaction vessel where they come into contact with a high purity silicon surface electrically heated to 1400 Kelvin. Back reaction is highly endothermic and occurs on the surface of silicon to deposit additional silicon. So, of course, melting point is 1687 Kelvin. A secondary product of the deposition reaction is essentially tetrachlorosilane or silicon tetrachloride. Let me show you those uh, reactions involved in uh, this procedure. So, SiO2 is first treated with carbon to reduce it to silicon. And then silicon is treated with HCl sixteen hundred Kelvin. You can reverse it at fourteen hundred Kelvin. It gives trichlorosilane SiHCl three plus H two. Okay, and then. Trichlorosilane is combined with H2 to form silicon plus 8 HCl plus the byproduct is as I mentioned SiCl4. Of course, SiCl finds numerous application. This is one of the method of uh, getting SiCl4 as well. So, a more recently developed CVD process starts with SiH4 instead of SiHCl3. Uh, one can also prepare. So, a more recent method of CVD utilizes uh, silane that is SiH4 instead of trichlorosilane. So, I will show you some uh, reactions here uh, to make silane. Silane is much more volatile that is the reason in place of trichlorosilane simply silane is used. So, these are all the redistribution reactions. So, SiH4 can readily give Si plus 2H2. Okay. You can see here the a typical CVD uh, setup is shown here. Okay. So, SiHCl3 plus H2 is passed here, and of course, uh, here we have a a silicon surface is there on which uh, 
silicon vapors will be deposited and then here uh, all these uh, gaseous substances will escape okay, HCl, SiCl4, H2, SiHCl3 and they can be collected here through cooling or condensation. So, extraction of uh, tin from its ore depends on redox chemistry. Uh, here uh, one can conveniently convert SnO2 by using carbon as a reducing agent to get Sn. Okay. Uh, in case of lead, the concentrated ore is roasted in a furnace at a moderate temperature. The temperature of furnace is essentially controlled by regulating the air supply. During roasting, galena that is lead sulphide is partly oxidized to lead monoxide and partly to lead sulphate. For example, So, this PBS okay, can further react with oxygen to form PBSO4. Okay. So, uh, now more of galena can be added, this is called self reduction uh, to lead sulphide. If you add lead oxide and the temperature is raised, okay, there will be reduction that is also called auto reduction or self reduction. In this process what happens? lead sulphide is combined with lead oxide in absence of air uh, to reduce Pb and thus SO2 is formed here S2 minus is essentially acting as a reducing agent, S2 minus acts as a reducing agent. Similarly, one can also combine PBS with PbSO4 to give 2Pb plus 2SO2. Okay. So, one of these methods can be conveniently used uh, to get pure lead from the corresponding sulphide ore. Uh, uh, I have just displayed some physical properties of group 14 elements and, <coughs> and you can see here enthalpy of atomization is decreasing uh, that indicates volatile nature of uh, heavier group 14 elements and melting point also steadily decreasing and boiling point also decreases and st standard enthalpy also decreases here in this case and first ionization energy uh, also decreases. Uh, second ionization energy everything whether you consider first, second, third or fourth they all decrease down the group uh, due to the increase in the uh, size. Okay. What are the special features uh, of group 14 elements? The periodic changes among the chemistry of these elements are strictly followed. Uh, the stability and abundance of carbon-carbon uh, bonded compounds, the importance of pi bonding in carbon compounds very, very important. Perhaps uh, carbon forms largest number of catenated compounds, uh, essentially it is because of uh, uh, very strong pi bonding we come across between carbon carbon uh, atoms between two carbon atoms. They show major differences from the lightest uh, element carbon to the heaviest element lead, a typical main group element. The similar trends are followed by almost most of the uh, main group elements whether we consider group 1, group 2, 13, 14, 15, 16 or 17 and 18 and group oxidate is plus 4. It is very, very important for carbon and silicon. In hydrocarbons, the oxidation is formally minus 4. These compounds are thermodynamically unstable, but an extremely important class of compounds which have constituted the branch of organic chemistry. That means essentially organic chemistry is essentially branch of one of the group 14 elements that is carbon. So, other features are germanium shows some stable plus 2 compounds like germanium iodide GeI2 although plus 4 state is still predominant and tin uh, shows both plus 2 and plus 4 states and plus 2 is reducing agent when it is in plus 2 state it is a reducing agent whereas lead 4 plus is oxidizing and Pb2 plus is quite stable in fact PbO2 with lead in plus 4 state is a very powerful oxidizing agent. Okay. 
So, these elements in principle should show plus 2 oxy state using 2 p electrons. So, promotion of an electron from NS2 to NP requires energy, but the atom can now form 4 bonds. That means essentially when the 2 bonds are formed by looking to the bond strength and how much energy is released during the formation of the 2 bonds, one can decide whether that compensates the energy required to promote NS2 electron to the next NP orbital. If that happens, then uh, in principle they can show higher oxy state. So, essentially more energy is produced by bond formation in the case of carbon and silicon offsets the cost of promoting an S electron. So, as a result tetravalent state is very stable for carbon and silicon. In fact, for the same reason they do not show inert pair effect. That means, I tell you again more energy produced by bond formation for carbon and silicon offsets the cost of promoting an S electron to P orbital. So, as a result what happens? Uh, it shows stable plus 4 oxy state and bond strength you should remember decreases down the group no matter which element we are considering for the bond formation as we are taking hydrides, oxides or halides. Bond strength decreases from carbon to lead. Uh, that means, the energy that is liberated while formation of the bonds is not compensating the energy required to promote the NS2 electrons to the NP in case of heavier elements. As a result what happens? S electrons remain intact uh, and paired. As a result this inert pair effect comes into picture in case of heavier uh, p block elements and in case of group uh, 14 it is a tin and to a larger extent lead shows inert pair effect. So, important feature of group 14 elements is catenation which is less important down the group and of course, catenation is very important in case of uh, carbon. The next uh, element that shows maximum catenation comes from group 16 that is sulphur. So, important source of carbon are essentially coal and crude oil and natural gas. In natural gas the major component is methane CH4. Carbon is known for showing allotropy, graphite, diamond and soot are important allotropes of uh, carbon. Catenation is the formation of rings and chains by atoms of the same element. After carbon, sulfur forms the next largest number of catenated compounds. Let us look into the allotropes of carbon. Uh, the graphite is one of the important allotropes of uh, carbon. Graphite consists of stacked two dimensional carbon sheets. Oxidizing agents or reducing agents may be intercalated between these sheets with concomitant electron transfer. Graphite is more reactive than diamond. Uh, it is oxidized by atmospheric oxygen above 970 Kelvin, whereas diamond burns at greater than 1170 Kelvin. Uh, graphite reacts with hot concentrated nitric acid to give an aromatic compound having this composition. I am telling you graphite reacts with hot concentrated nitric acid to give the aromatic compound having this composition. In graphite, the carbon atoms form planar sheets of 6 membered rings very similar to benzene having each carbon undergone sp2 hybridization in terms of valence bond theory. The remaining pz orbitals form extensive delocalized pi system over the entire sheet. So, attraction between the adjacent sheets is weak and so the graphite layers can be slided over each other very easily. Uh, graphite structure is unique for carbon among group 14 elements because the small pz orbitals on carbon can overlap effectively to form the delocalized pi system over the entire sheet of graphite. Okay, you can see here this is how the graphite uh, looks like each layer is consists of 6 membered uh, ring uh, okay, it connected with adjacent uh, carbon atoms. And if you look into uh, the, the separation between 
graphite layers, this is about 335 picometer and CC bond distance in graphite is 142 picometer. Okay. And here weak uh, pi interactions hold them together. So, as a result, these graphite layers can slide very easily over the other. This is where the lubricating properties of graphite comes into the picture. Okay. <coughs> this is uh, alpha graphite and this is beta graphite. You can just see the difference between the uh, structural difference between alpha graphite and beta graphite. And graphite can form intercalation compounds. That means uh, graphite can act as either an electron donor or an electron acceptor towards atoms and ions that penetrate between its sheets and give rise to an intercalation compound, the formation of which involves movement apart of the carbon layers and the penetration of atoms or ions between them. So, there are two general types of compounds we come across, okay. the colorless non-conductors of electricity in which the carbon layers becomes buckled owing to the saturation of the carbon atoms and loss of the pi system when it is buckled the pi system is destroyed. So, colored electrical conductors in which the planarity and pi delocalization of the layers are retained. So, this uh, <coughs> polymeric carbon monofluorides that means CFN. So, where n is greater than or equal to 1 is a widely studied example of the first type of compound. It is formed when F2 reacts with graphite at 720 Kelvin or at uh, lower temperature in presence of hydrofluoric acid or hydrogen fluoride. Although at 970 Kelvin the product is monomeric. That means if you take graphite and pass uh, fluorine at 720, okay, so uh, it gives CF4. The second class of intercalation compounds includes the blue graphite salts formed with strong acids in the presence of oxidizing agents and the metallic looking red or blue compounds are formed when graphite reacts with group 1 metals. Okay. For example, when graphite is treated with an excess of potassium vapors, a paramagnetic compound colored material, copper colored material formulated as Kc8 is formed. Okay. Kc8, of course, here you can something like this. Okay. So, the penetration of this K plus ions between the layers causes structural changes. So, these potassium vapors when they are passed into the graphite, so these uh, potassium ions goes and sits in between the graphite layer. As a result, what happens? The distance between the graphite layers increases from 335 picometer to 540 picometer. Uh, the K plus ions lie above or below the center of alternate C6 rings by forming a layers of centered hexagonal motifs. Okay, for example, if we take potassium vapors and pass it into the graphite, okay, around 300 degree centigrade, okay, we get Kc8. Okay. So, uh, heating Kc8 leads to the formation of a series of decomposition products. There are 1, 2, 3, 4 or 5 carbon layers respectively between layers of K plus ions. For example, uh, if you take K C8 and if you heat it, it can give K C24. If you heat further, it can give K C36 and further heating, it can also form K C48 and it can give Kc60. Okay. So, this is a copper colored. So, this is essentially looks like copper colored. And this is blue. So, we have prepared Kc8 uh, in our laboratory. In my next lecture, I remember to show that uh, uh, Kc8. 
uh, you can see here how potassium vapor sits between the layers. For example, graphite layers if you consider these red lines represent graphite layers and uh, the distance between uh, graphite layers is 3.35 angstrom units or 335 picometer. When uh, potassium vapors are passed around 300 uh, Kelvin around 300 degree centigrade. Uh, so, this blue lines represent potassium ions sitting in between and uh, ok. So, here the distance now increases from 335 to 540 picometer. You can see here graphite layers can be clearly seen here and also this uh, small ok dots represent potassium atoms here ok. And this how one can also visualize uh, how between uh, uh, graphite layers potassium is sitting here ok and also one can also see here ok. And, and this gives a clear picture of uh, uh, the potassium atom sitting between the graphite layers and this purple one represent potassium. And in fact, uh, if you just look into each potassium, it, it is encapsulated by uh, 8 carbon atoms 4 below and 4 above giving a square antiprismatic geometry for potassium atom. That means, uh, potassium atom is at the center of a square antiprismatic uh, geometry with 8 corners are occupied by carbon atoms in this fashion you can see here ok. Yeah. So, the graphite interlayer distance increases upon calcium intercalation similarly one can also include calcium by, by passing calcium vapors here the composition will be CaC6 that means here calcium sits ok. Uh, in an octahedral cavity surrounded by 6 carbon atoms. So, in this case uh, the distance increases from 335 picometer to 452 picometer and the carbon carbon distance also increases from 1.42 to initially in graphite to 1.444 angstrom units ok. And graphite consists of multi layers of carbon atoms a single isolated layer is essentially called graphene. For example, if, if you assume uh, this the entire is graphite, if I just take out one sheet here ok, this single sheet is essentially called as graphene ok. First it was prepared in 2004, graphene has been the center of considerable research both to study its properties and to develop efficient ways to prepare graphene sheets. A graphene is remarkably resistant to fracture and deformation as a high thermal conductivity and has a, a conduction band that touches its valence band ok. So, graphene has been prepared both by mechanically peeling away the layers of graphite uh, as I said mechanically peeling is essentially something like this so take out ok. Uh, this if it is there just if you take out this is called mechanical peeling. Uh, away layers of graphite and by more specialized techniques including chemical vapor deposition on metal substances or metal substrates. Graphene represents an essentially two dimensional structure of a thickness of approximately 340 picometer. Its honeycomb like surface has been imaged using scanning transmission microscopy that is STM. Numerous applications of graphene have been proposed including their use in energy storage materials, micro sensor devices, liquid crystal displays, polymer composites and several other electronic devices ok. So, this is how a single sheet of graphene looks like this essentially uh, taking out a single layer effectively from graphite will uh, constitute a graphene it, it is a two dimensional single sheet. So, uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, the structure of carbon nanotube can be imagined as a cylinder formed by rolling a graphene sheet and then closing it at both sides. It is something like this. If it is a graphene sheet, if you just roll it and just uh, clip it here, ok, this essentially represents carbon nanotube, ok. Uh, graphene can be put into thin strips or nano ribbons by lithographic techniques. These ribbons are described by their edges either zigzag or armchair. One can join the edges of nano ribbons together to form such nanotubes in several ways. It can also form multi layer carbon nanotubes in which one layer have pi interaction with another layer. 
So, one can play around once you know how to isolate uh, a single sheet of graphite that is graphene. You can play around and you come up with an interesting array of carbon nanotubes having very different shapes. So, let me continue uh, discussing in my next lecture. Until then have a very pleasant reading of inorganic chemistry especially group 14 elements. Thank you very much.